and we are live. Okay. Hey, everybody that's uh, checking us out on Facebook, uh, streaming live. Thank you for your patience. We wanted to make sure all of our participants were in safe and sound. And um, if you're not new to the Zoom world, which I would assume at this point, everyone is familiar, you never count on uh, ease of technology. So thanks for bearing with us, but we are all, all here and, and delighted that you're joining us on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I'm Sean Murphy. I am the founding uh, direct, executive director of 1455. We are a nonprofit literary organization. And put simply, our mission is just to celebrate creativity and build community by any means possible. And one of the ways we've done that, particularly the last year, is by putting on as many free programs as possible to celebrate voices in the writing community worldwide. Um, we have a soft spot for our Virginia, DC area. I'm wearing my Virginia's for Lovers shirt on purpose today, but we really are uh, an organization that wants to be inclusive and, and celebrate the act of storytelling in all of its myriad forms. And uh, if you wanna find out more about the organization, check us out at 1455litarts.org. Uh, one of the things I'm really proud of is we are actively collaborating with like-minded organizations and individuals. So this opportunity today comes from a partnership that I'm really proud to talk about uh, with Robert Bettman of Day 8. I wanna call him out in particular because without him, this event today does not happen. Uh, Robert is the man behind the scenes of the Anacostia Swim Club. And for those of you that have wondered, looking at the promotional materials, what's the Anacostia Swim Club? I'm happy to tell you what it is. Uh, it is in short, um, well, let me start by saying this, because I wasn't aware of this myself. Um, it's currently both unsafe and illegal to swim in the Anacostia River, uh, which is a travesty on, on so many different levels. And the impetus behind this Anacostia Swim Club is it's a social club. And the idea is to put on events where members can enjoy arts and cultural events, along with service to the community along the Anacostia River corridor. Uh, the goal here, obviously, is to spread awareness, where possible, raise funds and enthusiasm to do ecological work, celebrate creativity, and you can learn a lot more about this organization at anacostiaswimclub.com. So 1455 and Anacostia Swim Club are together today to present this special reading and discussion about a brand new anthology that I'm so proud to hold in my hands as a fan of so many of these writers. I'm also very humbled to be included in this uh, anthology. I can't recommend strongly enough if you want to get a sense of, um, of a really good cross section of contemporary thought about what makes America what it is, ranging from poetry to fiction. Over a hundred writers are uh, collected, and it's a phenomenal piece of work. It's an unbelievable labor of love. And without further ado, we have some uh, contributors that are going to read and discuss the anthology, but first and foremost, I want to welcome the two co-editors who are with us today. That's Caroline Bach and Jonah Colson. Thank you both for being here, uh, and thank you both for agreeing months ago to work with me and coordinate this reading, which involved what you did to put the anthology together, putting a call out to get willing participants, wrangling that participation, and being there to organize all aspects of it. So. All credit and gratitude goes to you both for helping me pull this together. And I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I think this is a real, this is a real celebration. Uh, I know the anthology has been out for a while now. It's getting rapturous praise as it should be. And I think it's a great opportunity today to shine some additional light uh, and talk a little bit about how this anthology came together. Um, I'd be remiss to not mention, and I'll mention it again, this anthology is for sale and you can get it at the Washington Writers site at www.washingtonwriters.org. And we're recording this event. I will put it on the 1455 site and the 1455 Facebook page. I'll put links in. I'll put information about all the people you're gonna hear read today. I encourage you to not only buy a copy of this anthology for yourself and a friend, but check out the writers who are gonna read today because they're all putting forth amazing work on their own. So with that said, I think it would make sense. Let me read some bios. I'll introduce Caroline and Jonah. I'm gonna to talk to them a little bit about how this all, this beautiful work came together. Then we're gonna to hear from some contributors and then we'll have some further discussion. 
If you have questions, please put them in the comment section on our Facebook page and we'll get to those as we have time. So Caroline, Caroline Bach is the author of the short story collection, Carry Her Home, which was the winner of the 2018 Fiction Award from the Washington Writers Publishing House and the young adult novels, Lie and Before My Eyes from St. Martin's Press. She's at work on a new novel set in 2050, which was honored with a Montgomery County Artists and Scholars Award. She's also the fiction editor of This Is What America Looks Like, Poetry and Fiction from DC, Maryland, and Virginia. And her partner in crime on this amazing endeavor is Jonah Colson. Jonah's first poetry collection, Said Through Glass, won the 2018 Gene Feldman Poetry Prize from Washington Writers Publishing House. His poems have appeared in, among others, Plowshares, The Southern Review, The Massachusetts Review, and elsewhere. His translations and interviews can be found in The Prairie Schooner, Tupelo Quarterly, and The Writer's Chronicle. He's received fellowships for the Virginia Center for Creative Arts and the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. He's an associate professor of ECL at Montgomery College in Maryland and lives in Washington, DC. He is co-editor of the anthology, This Is What America Looks Like. Caroline and Jonah, welcome. Uh, thank you for not only being here today, but thank you as a writer and reader, more importantly, um, for the unbelievable heavy lifting that was required for this labor of love. I think it's very appropriate to start at the beginning and you both can riff on how did this come together? What was the idea? And when did it start to go from idea to execution? That's you, Caroline. Well, I'll start because somehow it was my crazy idea that um, we could have an anthology at the Washington Writers Publishing House. Uh, the last one was 25 years ago. Uh, and I turned to Kathleen after having this idea coming out of the Women's March, where one of the chants was, what does America look like? This is what America looks like, meaning inclusive, diverse, um, joyous, hopeful, forward-looking. Um, so it was very much a reaction to those uh, marches. Uh, and Kathleen said, well, we haven't done one in 25 years. Uh, maybe we can. And Jonah raised his hand and said, what about poetry? And I said, of course, we need poetry. Uh, uh, but I am not a poet. Uh, occasionally, I'll write a poem, but uh, Joanna is the poet. And we had been partners in crime before. We won our awards from uh, the Washington Writers Publishing House at the same time. So uh, I knew what a good poet he was. Um, I didn't think that we would uh, do this and the pandemic would hit and the world would close down because that happened immediately as soon as we decided to launch this and open submissions. So we went on quite a journey together. Uh, Jonah and I and Kathleen, we could not have done it without our president and publisher behind us. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. I, I, you know, I'll agree with everything that uh, Caroline said and, and, um, and praise uh, Kathleen, our president as well. You know, uh, we didn't have sort of these topics in mind when we initially started this, but as Caroline said, when the pandemic hit and the Black Lives Matter movement, um, yeah. you know, things changed, and we got this one, these wonderful, uh, you know, poems and 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 fiction in response to just you know such the instability that was happening at the moment, and it was so wonderful to receive uh, work that was writing in the moment, and we were getting it at the moment. And just the writers were able to respond, many writers very quickly to um, the immediacy was just wonderful. It's been a wonderful experience. I was happy to happy to be included. Well, that that goes, I, 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 that's wonderful to hear. And I think it, it, it generally goes without saying, I think anyone who is certainly a writer, but I think anyone that, that would call themselves a dedicated reader understands, you know, inherently that a lot of work would go into organizing uh, an anthology like this that, that is such a cross section, both of genre, you know, topicality, but also, you know, trying to get a specific call for a specific topic. Um, 
So I would be, I would be happy to hear you talk about some of the challenges, but I think I would really like to hear um, understanding that this was a, an unbelievable amount of work and time put in. What was the most gratifying part for each of you being involved now that this has come to fruition and you can, we can ha- hold it in our hands and, uh, and talk about it? Well, I think the fact that we could hold it in our hands, which is considering that we had numerous unexpected challenges. Um, the I think at this point, there is a urgency for writers to sort of think and interpret and and dive into the moment. So we got that urgency and, and were flooded with responses. We had almost a thousand pieces of work to go through. Um, but the fact that we could actually pull together in a pandemic when the publisher was shutting down, when the Library of Congress was shutting down, who does the copyright, when we were um, only could deal with each other on email or Zoom, all those challenges made it feel so much more gratifying that we have this. It's only out this month. I mean, this is, you know, right fresh, fresh, hot work. Um, But I think it's going to have legs. I think it speaks to um, uh, America now as much as I thought it would a year and a half ago when we first started discussing this. Jonah, what do you think? No, uh, um, absolutely. You know, when we, when this all happened and, and our world just suddenly changed, um, you know, we, uh, we all had a moment of, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? How do we adjust? And having this project to work on was so wonderful. I got to read wonderful work. I got to contribute. And I think it got me through the summer and I was so happy to be able to be a part of it. And yes, holding it in your hand is a wonderful feeling to have after having worked on a project for so long. Well, you know, I, I, I think, I would do both of you a disservice, and Kathleen, who's here with us too, a disservice by not at least spending a minute or two for, for people that are either curious or, or to, to, to augment the sense of awe that a task like this um, requires. Talk us, you know, for the, for the lay person, like from start to finish, like, you know, I think people can conceptualize like, yeah, you, you had a topic and you got a bunch of writers, but I mean, we, we're talking about soliciting the work editing the work, choosing which work, um, and then everything from from production to outreach, which you've done an amazing job uh, of getting some local press. Um, you know, any any thoughts about, um, you know, the process from beginning again as just an organic kind of from A to Z process? Well, a very good question, Sean. I mean, I think for anyone considering an anthology, make sure you have a team behind you who is going to work hard and be as enthusiastic uh, about it. And at the Washington Writers Publishing House, we're all volunteer cooperative press. So it is uh, sort of baked into the spirit of the place. Um, And it's uh, been around uh, for almost 48 years. It started as a hippie collective. So I think you have to start with that that spirit, but I do think you need a really strong sense of organization. Um, I know that I must have driven Kathleen and Jonah crazy by going, we need a meeting every other week and that's it <laughs> for the next year. Um, and then, you know, we're all gonna have to respond to each other on email quickly. Um, and you know, it's, uh, and we're going to need to reach out to writers who may not have known us. So we did a whole outreach to ensure that we had the diversity, um, that we have in the magazine, in the anthology. Um, when you say you want to be diverse, it doesn't just happen. You have to take that effort. And I think Jonah and I really took that to heart and used, you know, all the, um, uh, networks that we have, all of the uh, outreach that we could do via social media to really reach writers um, who we knew, but also writers that we didn't know. Uh, yeah. Jonah, anything else on should somebody go out there in the world and do this anthology? What an anthology? What do they have to think about? Well, I think you spoke to a lot of it, you know, but so much of it is outreach and answering. It's a lot of, you know, admin and keeping things organized. 
and blessed be that Kathleen and Caroline kept me organized. And with our biweekly meetings, they were you know just wonderful. But I think for me, the uh, the most um, difficult part of this is when you get everything done. You know, of course, sending out rejections is horrible. You don't want to send out rejections, but you know, with the space and everything, I mean, it's just part of the part of the deal. But the proofreading, you know, making sure that every name is right, which didn't happen, but make it on my end, and making sure that everything is spelled correctly and with poems, and making sure the formatting is right. I mean, proofreading, proofreading, proofreading is absolutely exhausting, and uh, that was a challenge. Yeah, and, and to be clear, the reason I really asked that question was, was frankly, I think you both would be too modest. I, I don't wanna, anyone out there that is feeling inspired, I hope you are inspired to engage with your literary communities and, and, and contemplate a task like this. But I just wanted to make sure that someone recognized uh, that's aware of, of how these things work, the enormous amount of, of uh, unpaid and often unrecognized time and effort. So it's, it's a tremendous accomplishment. Uh, you all should be very proud uh, that, that you, you took something from idea to such a beautiful, uh, the design, you know, every element of this is tight and, and wonderful. And, and for whatever it's worth, Carolyn, I agree with you. I think this is gonna have legs for a variety of reasons. It's quality work, but also it speaks to a very, very relevant uh, question that we've been asking uh, and I think as Americans, we've been asking forever, but it's now that we're starting to be more inclusive for all the right reasons, it, it resonates to hear voices that are not maybe the, the typical voices we all grew up hearing. Uh, I think that's all to the good. Um, before we get to the reading, the last question I want to ask each of you is, um, talk about something you learn about your local community and or America as a result of being directly involved with this project. I, I have to say I am uh, grateful for all of the writers who did contribute, whether we accepted them or not. They really took a leap, uh, I think, to submit to a small nonprofit cooperative press. And they were generous. And the writers that we did choose, uh, who I'm so proud of all of their work, um, I am, I am so amazed at the scope of what they they attempted and and i'm really um really proud of of their work i'm excited for them i'm excited for um the uh andrew tran who is uh comes from a vietnamese immigrant family having his first work published with us. And I'm excited that Grace Cavalieri, who is the Poet Laureate of Maryland and uh, was the first person to submit to our anthology. So it's really the range um, that amazed me and, and the uh, opportunity to work with these writers. Yeah, I, I would agree just being able to discover um, new writers and read new work from writers that I know. It's just been one of the, an absolute, um, absolute pleasure in working on this anthology. And just, you know, hearing more work from Holly and Jonathan and reading for the first time Cacao. So it's just been, um, it's just a wonderful experience. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a, that, that tees up our, our, our segue nicely, because if I'm not mistaken, Caroline, uh, Jonah was gonna read first, uh, from the introduction. So what a what better way to kick off the reading than to kind of take it from the top and then we'll, we'll, we'll narrow in to the different contributors. Sure. Okay, so I'll just read just briefly from the introduction um, of This is What America Looks Like, available now at your favorite, at your favorite place. So the poems included here are intentional and focused. And they engage with current conversations about the pandemic, mass incarceration, police violence, racial profiling, educational systems, aging government policies, and gender and sexual expectations. Each of these conversations had its own particular place in history, and the poet has taken this conversation in image, metaphor, rhythm, narrative, all the tools of the poet. And I'm so proud of all of these poems that are included here. So I believe our first reader today is actually going to be Sean Murphy, is that correct? 
Oh, uh, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, Caroline. Donna, I was going to read the intro and then Taylor is going to be our first. So I'm going to read the fiction intro, just the opening. Uh, it will give you a sense of uh, the emotion I, I felt writing this, hopefully. So it's a fiction intro from our favorite anthology. If there had only been a pandemic, that would have been enough. If there had only been an economic unraveling, that would have been enough. If there had only been a racial reckoning, a social justice uprising, a need to say their names and to affirm that Black Lives Matter, that would have been more than enough. Enough to write about for me, for us all, to fill one anthology and perhaps many others. However, as the pandemic hit and the world shut down, I wondered if we should continue, if we would have any writers submit, or if the work they submitted be, would be ragged with rage and anxiety. I wondered if the entire endeavor was hopeless. To my delight and amazement, I found more than enough in the fiction that was submitted to This Is What America Looks Like, poetry and fiction from DC, Maryland, and Virginia. So now I am thrilled to introduce our first fiction writer, Taylor Ramaj, uh, who has a short uh, piece of fiction, but a wonderful background. Taylor Ramage is the author of two poetry collections, Forgive Us Our Trespasses and Lest I Know Your Weakness. She is also a fantasy writer and has published other poems and short stories in online magazines. Taylor loves stories in all forms and has something to learn from all of them. So from Baltimore, Maryland, Taylor Ramage. Great, thank you, Carolyn. Um... This is my piece called The Longest Baptism. Stay with me, breathe slowly. This is the longest baptism and our fingertips nearly break the surface. You've just opened your eyes to the stinging, but I've been here for ages. It's time for you to know these waters. First, the hulls of massive ships glided above like swarms of beetles, blocking the blurry sun. Across, then back, then across again. The temporary night they made in their passage was peppered with muted splashes, disturbances in the water's flowing silence. In the distance, you could see the bodies sinking with the weight of their fall until the water pushed them up into resurrection, motionless, bloated, but not destined for where those ships docked. Then boots splashed on missions from bank to bank, young men who held these truths to be self-evident that they were created equal. But there was so much blood as the generations sought freedom by a different definition. If you pay attention, you can still see the ripples skating across the surface. New feet crush those who had known each rock beneath the surface since the beginning of time. Ever expanding, their footprints scarred the earth. The stretching towers and the sickening waste came quickly, but so did the bridges that echoed with marches. I saw every color through my wavy, weary lens. First black and brown, then the rainbow that boldly flooded the streets. The rains muffled their cries and carried the dyes bleeding from their flags back here. Sometimes you'll see the remains float by, a scrap of fabric, a scrap of quilted fabric with the dearly beloved's name and the short years they swam among us before the illness came or a piece of an outfit discarded for being an abomination adorning the wrong body. I know. Until now, you didn't realize the depths of these waters or feel them rising. Stay with me, breathe easily. Some do go down to the river to pray. 
They submerge as one thing and rise as another, electrified. On those days, this place isn't as murky. I see how light their forms are in the water, so much uncontrollable dancing with the pool of gravity eased. Their movement is a sermon of being dead than alive, and I start believing again in that first gasp after breaking the surface. Thank you. Thank you so much, Taylor. That was beautiful. Totally wonderful. Um, our next reader will be Sean Murphy. And again, thank you, Sean, so much for this, for getting all this together. So Sean Murphy has appeared on NPR and been published in USA Today, The New York Times, The Huffington Post, Salon, The Village Voice, The Good Men Project, Memoir Magazine, and others. He has twice been nominated for the Pushcart Prize and is founding director of 1455. So. Thank you, Sean. I'm so, so happy to, you're included in this anthology. Thank you, Jonah and, and, and Caroline. I, um, I'm, I'm delighted, I'm honored to be a part of this. So uh, to be kind of emceeing this event today was a no brainer. And, I, and again, I'm happy to give uh, as much attention as this anthology warrants, but as a, as a contributor, it's also a tremendous honor to be included amongst these incredible writers. So um, by way of very brief introduction, I'm a Northern Virginia boy. Uh, born and raised and lived for decades in Reston, Virginia, right outside of DC. Um, but this poem actually is inspired by my adopted hometown of Winchester, Virginia, where I've been the last few years, um, mostly full-time, uh, where we've purchased property to try to open a writer's retreat, which will be part of the 1455 mission. So this is a Winchester poem, one of a handful I've written. Um, so this is a pretty new piece, uh, definitely a reflection to my take on what America looks like. It's called South Loudon Street After Midnight Tonight. Competing scents settle for a stalemate, undecided about what's happening and what already happened. Old mothers wearing slippers in the summer with cigarettes like extra limbs, expunging stale smoke into dying air, already appropriate for a screenplay. Scattered trash defiant and strewn across lawns, no longer useful indoors, but neither noteworthy nor consigned to the recycling bin just yet. Warped wood embarrassed by itself, unable to keep up appearances. It broils during the day and at night the rot soaks in, settling like caked makeup on an ancient face. Invisible men search out invisible women while invisible cats stalk invisible prey beneath fraying clotheslines, burdened by half-soaked bedsheets, waiting for either rain or an intervention. Street soldiers without homes patrol the sum total of places they're neither welcomed nor noticed, mutely content allowing their minds to pull strings as part of a play that writes itself. Veterans of the alleys and shadows amble or else wheel themselves in and out of corners, their hearts preserving what their memories can no longer make any sense of. Businesses out of business for lack of business insist it's nobody's business, and the dead animals that keep other things alive wonder if their sacrifice is in vain. Nothing to see, nothing to sell, nothing to steal, nowhere else to go. If this pavement could talk, it would, and it does, but it'll take a few news cycles before we know what it's saying. Streetlights, tired of pleading the fifth, simply refuse to shine and let things unfold the way they do in the wild. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. I love that last line too, let things unfold the way they do in the wild. Totally great. Thank you. Um, next, we have Holly Karapekova. You know it's going to mess up your last name, Holly. She's the author of two books of poetry, Words We Might One Day Say and Toline. Her poetry, prose, and translations have appeared widely. She teaches at Marymount University and is currently serving, at, serving as Poet Laureate of Arlington County. So welcome, Poet Laureate. Thank you, Jonah. Thank you, Jonah and Caroline, for your amazing work on this anthology. And Kathleen, thank you too. 
Um, Sean, thanks for hosting and all of you. I'm so excited to be here with you with all these amazing writers. Um, I'm gonna read my poems. I, I won't say too much about them, except um, I've been living here in DC for about 14 years now, but I was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia and uh, in the 80s and 90s. And it was a very interesting place uh, in terms of racial dynamics to grow up. Um, so these poems are both kind of coming out of that experience. And the first one is called Dear White Girl. Dear Errata, Apology. Dear Sugar and Spice, Cherry and Cherry Pop. Dear Pillar of Salt, Pillar of the Plantation, Love and Charity to All. Dear Barbie doll in a permanent ball gown, Barbie dream house, and who'd she have to marry to end up there? Dear Laurel tree and hollow reeds, Dear sorrow becomes stone, caged in the forest, turned into a bird. Dear picked flowers, wild and domesticated. Dear Wyoming and Louisiana and 81 cents to the dollar. Dear Scylla and Charybdis, good witches of the North and South, governor's wife, overseer's wife, CEO's wife, slumlord's wife. I didn't mean what I said. Please don't let me end up with that old maid card in my hand. And this other poem is called Southern Living and it has an epigraph from a website without sanctuary po photographs and postcards of lynching in America. If you haven't seen this site, I highly recommend it. It's harrowing, um, but it is uh, very much a part of our history. I turn to leave, but it is always sunset. The shadows stretch, each knuckle a knot, each tree a body shifting in the wind. In the postcard photograph, white faces crowd in to watch. I cannot see their features clearly enough to know I am not among them. On the back, a photo credit, a county and state proof of witness. Sometimes a note, coon cooking, all okay and would like to get a post from you. Then a scrawled signature, a name and address. Strike a match and we all go up in smoke. Thank you. Wow, Holly. The idea of witness came up several in several poems and even some stories that, you know, even if it's not our personal experience, we're a witness to it and that changes us. Um, and I think that is a potent thread through the pieces. Um, now I have the great honor of uh, introducing Patricia Schulteis. Um, Patricia is the author of Baltimore's Lexington Market. I didn't realize I had picked two Baltimore area writers in the right this moment. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not. I... <laughs> well, area, area, Baltimore Lexington Market, published by Arcadia Publishing in 2007 and of St. Bart's Way, an award-winning short story collection published by the Washington Writers Publishing House in 2015. Her memoir, A Balanced Life, was published by All Things That Matter Press in 2018. She's a member of the Authors Guild and the National Book uh, Critics Circle. And I'm thrilled to introduce her and she will read her short story now. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Caroline. And thank you and Jonah for putting together this wonderful anthology. It's um, it's been wonder, it, it's just been great to be included. It's a true honor. And thank you, Kathleen, for all you've done for the, um, for the press, uh, your devotion and your very gracious and kind uh, suggestions from time to time. And thank you, Sean, for uh, hosting this and putting this together. And finally, I'd like to thank my son, Kurt, and uh, Stephanie White for holding my hand through my Zoom hysterias. Um, my story, A Blaze of Stars, is set in a uh, community on the west of Baltimore 
uh, I've changed the name, but I had the privilege of living there for 22 years. So it's an actual place and the characters are all fictitious. A Blaze of Stars, a frigid Saturday and since lunch, Robert has been sorting through document boxes. He's trying to organize the archives of Burnside, the old mill town where he and Lolita have lived for 30 some years. The afternoon has begun to wear thin when he hears China rattling. She's bringing him atonement chai. For months, his wife has found small ways to apologize for reneging on their agreement to retire together. He probably should have known she'd keep working. Ever since he met her at Oxford, she's carried the terror of pennilessness like a turtle carries its shell. But now, holding the tea tray and wearing one of his old NASA sweatshirts, she looks relaxed, toasty, almost content. He smiles. She sets the tea tray on a box of ledgers detailing the yards of woolen goods the Burnside Company sold to the Union Army. After handing him a cup, she sifts through old photos of the mill workers' houses. Narrow stone cottages without central heating or indoor plumbing. Amenities like those came decades later after the, the depression bankrupted the mill and developers bought everything, the mill, the houses, the school, the store, and transformed a dismal enclave on the western edge of Baltimore into a quaint Williamsburg-like village replete with shutters, picket fences, and brick walks. I know exactly where this one was taken. She hands him a picture of a dozen young women in crisp shirt waists and long skirts by the little stone cottage near the pond. That IRS guy lived there. A woman just bought it. She works for some NGO. Robert studies the picture. It had to have been taken on a Sunday. The Burnside workday ran from seven in the morning to five in the evening, except for Saturdays when it ended at one, which left the women an afternoon to wash and iron their shirt waists and maybe take a bath. Yet here they stand looking as if they'll burst into a fit of giggles at any minute. They're probably Scottish, she says. Mills recu recruited from Scotland because they needed workers skilled in working with wool. He hands the picture back and Lolita's phone beeps. She goes in the hall to take the call, then comes back. I have to go in. Robert knows better than to ask her why. She can't say. She worked for the National Security Agency. After she leaves, he washes the cups on the kitchen windows. On the kitchen windowsill, a statue of Shiva dances. And by, behind it, stars are popping out across the cloudless sky. He checks an app on his phone, bundles himself into layers of down and wool, and grabs his binoculars. Outside, Burnside looks abandoned. The only neighbor he sees is the stone cottage's new owner, who's hoisting a suitcase into her car. As she drives past, Robert recognizes that hyperfocus of someone needing to catch a flight. All those years of checking tracking stations for NASA, all those flights. The old mill pond offers the best vantage point for stargazing. Few trees obstruct the view of the horizon. He focuses binoculars on the northwest sky, but then lowers them. The sky is so clear he doesn't need any help to see a diamond bright object traveling like an errant but friendly star across the dark expanse, the International Space Station, the object of his NASA years, and yes, he must admit, the object of his devotion. He watches until it disappears. Then Robert stands alone by the pond where a grist mill first stood, and then the woolen mill, step by step from the grinding stone to the looms, 
to three people circling the earth for the sole purpose of discovery. Progress has been made. He has to believe that. He walks home up the street where in a few months, his Burnside neighbors will celebrate the 4th of July. He waits for Lolita and when she's back, he'll gather her to him because whether by chance or fate, they found each other. What a wonder that he, Robert Rodowski from Youngstown, Ohio, whose mother had checked groceries in the A&P and whose father had delivered mail and whose love of mathematics eventually earned him a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford, where one night in a pub, he met a woman who grew up in Manchester after her parents fled India and whose prickly personality has never ceased to fascinate him. And that they can lie secure in each other's warmth in this place built of stone and sweat by anonymous laborers who maybe on a cold cloudless night, just like this one, climb beneath coverlets worn by their own beloveds and who before they lower their lids happen to look out the window and see a vision to carry into their dreams. A blaze of stars dancing across a midnight blue expanse of space. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. That's beautiful. And again, such witness and imagery too, right? Um, it's wonderful when you hear these voices come out of an anthology that you've worked on and how they weave together in ways that you never thought they were going to sort of connect. Of course, they're all in the book, but you know, you hear these images and, you, and this idea of witness, which we've talked about. And in Sean's poem, I think he writes something, um, if this pavement could talk, right? I think there was a line in there, I'm paraphrasing badly, but it makes me think of Jonathan's poem too, which he's gonna read about uh, Manassas battlefield. Like if that battlefield could talk, if we could hear these, you know, these, um, and, then, and this is our way that we can hear them, right? Through our, through our work. So um, Jonathan Lewis is the author of Babel On, which won the 2017 L plus S Press Mid-Atlantic Chapbook Series Contest. His poetry has appeared in a variety of publications, including Beltway, Poetry Quarterly, Berkeley Poetry Review, Charleston Poets, Hawaii Review, Northern Virginia Review, and the Washington Post. And Lewis lives in Washington, DC. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Jonah. Uh, thank you, Carolyn. And thank you, Kathleen, for putting together this truly extraordinary anthology. Um, so many incredible writers. Every time I open it up, I'm reading something new. And um, it's, it's, it's really wonderful. So thank you for that. Um, so the poem, I'm Jonathan. Uh, I've lived in DC for 10 years now. This is the, this month will mark my 10 years. I'm originally from California. And uh, the impetus for this poem is um, I'd been spending some time just thinking a lot about the Civil War and what it takes for a country to reach that point. Um, and so I, um, I made a point of visiting a couple Civil War battlefields uh, that are in this area. And um, when I got to Manassas, um, where the first Battle of Bull Run took place, I saw a really striking image that I'd never seen before. Um, and I, I'd never heard of this. And um, I, it just, it, it felt very symbolic. So I decided to write a poem about it. Manassas Battlefield. Beyond the stretched shadows of Henry House Hill, beyond the cold cannons in the golden fields, Two trees rise up from crackling grass, an old black cherry outfitted in smooth bark, forced against the fleecy trunk of an eastern red cedar. Their bodies now intertwined as saplings, they must have grown in parallel. Then as juveniles, they jostled over this tiny parcel of land in a subterranean war of roots spilling forward like infantry. Eventually, they reached a standstill, two giants now keeping joint vigil over this quiet space where so many fell to the earth. 
huddled as one, they share a small breadth of peace. It's beautiful. Thank you, Jonathan. And that's one other thing about living in this part of the country, right? I mean, uh, there's so many battlefields and we think of all the things, specifically for the Civil War that have marched, marched through. Thank you. So our last poet today is Kekayo. And very excited to hear him read his poem from this anthology. So Kakayo is a poet, translator, and publisher. He teaches language arts at St. Mary's College of Maryland. He is the author of the book of poems, Povo and Enamorado, Love Dust, from Mizote Press, and editor of Zozoba Publishing, a literary press that focuses on, that focuses on Latinx letters in the US. So welcome Kakayo, thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me, uh, Kathleen, Jonah, and, and Caroline. Uh, having published uh, an anthology before, I I know what you're going through, and I can't imagine how happy you are, and at the same time how relieved you are that it's that it's finally out. So I thank you for all the work you've done and for the opportunity, Caroline. It's lovely to see you again. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we go we go back to a workshop and so it's really nice to see you and Sean thank you for hosting and thank you 1455 and I cannot wait to find out more about the Anacostia Swim Club the Anacostia was has always been a part of my DC life uh, I ended up in neighborhoods that that were really close to the Anacostia so it's a it's a it's a river that I have not swam in illegally yet but I have paddled but I have paddled, so it's 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 wonderful. Um, I can't wait to find out about about the club. Um, there are some poems that you don't throw away, but that you put away for a while. You know that they're done, and you just put them away, and you know there will be a moment where they can kind of see the light, and you never know when that's going to happen. So, and this is this is one of those poems that that, that got put away for a while. And, uh, and, and as soon as the call came out for this anthology, I knew that, I knew that, uh, that this, this could be a home. So it's an honor to be surrounded by such great writers and such great poets. Um, this poem is in honor of my enlisted Latinx brothers and sisters. You made it. All's not one upon entering the master's house. Less Southern lessons must be whispered into his ear. Bandidos in time past turned around massive enemies, you must say to him. Enduring ancestors sent your heroes home, scared and calling them gallinas, you must say to him. Together with accents from all over, you must enunciate clearly to your new compadres in uniform. Omnipotent promises of liberation must be sidestepped. Deliver the message with acrostic condemnation. Over the hills, you can see the future, boss. Return the virtual spoils of your lost causes. Take heed of what is wrong within. Unman the machines that carry false histories. Round up studies that chart hearts and minds and burn them with redemptive oil. Drink rainwater for three days and put your ear to the soil. Eat clay with young widows, young mothers, young sisters, young daughters. Unearth from the burial sites of your collateral damage. Open the path in your skin that will speak for you from now on, restoring all borders to their unguarded and confident oozing. Come on, say it with, say it with me. Tell your jefecito. In the unearthed stories of our cordilleras lays your salvation. This is the secret your elders wish you to say to him. Of the feast of this America, we cannot partake otherwise. Thank you. Wow. Um, thank you so much for that. That's a that's a 
pretty perfect uh, note to end on on the reading. Um, you know, one of the things that strikes me, I, I have to just say again, it's absolutely been my pleasure and a genuine honor uh, to be sharing screen time with, with an unbelievable cross-section of talent um, and diversity and these voices, which I think well represent uh, what this anthology is all about. Caroline and Jonah, before I let you off the hook, uh, I think one, one of the many common themes uh, that, that, that connect 1455's mission, what uh, both Day 8 and Anacostia Swim Club are doing, what Washington writers are doing, what this anthology does, is this notion of community, um, which I think, like most cliches, can, can be misunderstood. Like, it's obvious what community means, but I would love you to just say, and maybe some closing words, like, talk about the importance of community and being part of a literary community, because work like this uh, that we hold in our hands does not happen without belief in a literary community, but also active participation in supporting that community. So once again, I want to celebrate both of you for, for doing that and, and, and leading by example, but um, just talking about the importance of community and, and how it pertains specifically to the creative world. You're on mute, Caroline. Because that's a big question. I was hoping Jonah would answer it first. <laughs> I mean, I I would be lost. I'll just talk from my personal. I would be lost, particularly this past year, but my entire adult life, if I did not have the literary community, if I did not have places where I could have uh, thoughtful conversations with other writers and artists and uh whether it be poets whether it be fiction writers or creative nonfiction, um to have that space where um you know your inner your inner thoughts and soul are celebrated um and so i have searched for it all my life I feel like I'm at the point in my life I want to help create it, which is one reason I did the anthology. Um, but I think it's the secret to joy in life is to be surrounded by uh, other writers. And, you know, I'm happy to share that secret. Um, and I look over to Jose and and I I took a class with him on Duende about writing from a deep emotional place. And I thought, oh my God, I'm so glad he saved that poem for us. So I have to thank him in particular that somehow this connection through time, because I took one class was two or three sessions with him at the Writer's Center. And I feel a connection to this wonderful poet um, that transcends, you know, space and time. And a connection to everybody I work with on the anthology. And I don't know how you have that connection um, if you're not an artist in some way. Maybe other people have it in different ways. That's how I have it. Jonah, did I talk long enough so that you have an answer to? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 my answer is still not going to be as good as yours. Um, I got my MFA here at AU. Uh, this was years ago. And I kind of, you know, you, you build a community there. But then after I graduated, I didn't work on, um, you know, it's been years, right? And then my first book came out and published by Washington Writers Publishing House. And then I really immediately found that community again in a, you know, in a different way. And I met Holly, who was so generous. And of course, Kathleen, um, cause they're part, of, they're part of the press. And then I started doing, you know, promotions. And that's how I first met Jonathan. I think we did a, um, uh, some reading at Capitol Hill Writers or something, right? And, um, so it's just wonderful that when you are trying to, you know, promote your own work that you build a community. And I think what Caroline said too is, then once you see how wonderful that community gave to you, you want to give back. And it was part of the, you know, the impulse of this is to get these writers together and show more writers like here, we've done this and now, now take a look at these. So absolutely. Well, like I said, I mean, it's so obviously a labor of love and that applies to, again, the, the execution of the anthology, the, the promotion of it. And, and really, again, the idea of being part of something that's at once bigger than oneself and expands 
those micro communities and, and without that kind of energy and love, something like this doesn't come together. So for everyone that's checking this out, um, especially those of you that are either aspiring or active writers that don't feel part of a community or, or, or longing for that, it exists. It does involve effort, uh, but it, it should be to, to invoke this expression again, a labor of love, and you'll find yourself rewarded. So I certainly encourage you to check out Anacostia Swim Club. That's at uh, anacostiaswimclub.com. See what they're up to. See if you can help support or get involved. Check out Washington Writers. It's an unbelievable local resource um, for writers, for readers, for creatives. Um, you can easily support that mission, uh, be part of that mission. Um, check out 1455. We're always looking for collaboration and, and ways to lift the tides of creativity and community. And I, I really encourage you, if, if, if we haven't been able to convince you to get a copy of this, I'm not sure what more we can do, but I will use my opportunity to remind you that this wonderful uh, collection is available at www.washingtonwriters.org. Um, I want to personally thank everyone that was here today, Kakaya, Patricia, Caroline, Jonah, Holly, Kathleen, Taylor. Um, without everyone being here, this, this, this is, this does speak and live on its own, but it, it's something a little more, I think, especially in this time of, of virtual reality as we are unable to get together as we'd like to, and hopefully will again soon, being willing and able to, to share your work. Uh, it, for me personally, unbelievably meaningful very inspiring. I hope those of you that are tuning in are similarly inspired. Um, support your local communities and support your creatives because without that support, these types of things, I think they will happen, but they're a lot harder to achieve. So uh, in closing, thank all of you individually. And again, from the bottom of my heart, Jonah, Caroline, and Kathleen, thank you for all the work that you put into this and, and may it have a long life and, and may it continue to inspire people who come across it in the short and, and long term. Thank, Thank you very much, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, everybody. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. And as a reminder, I will be posting this video uh, on, on the 1455 site, and I'll pass that all around. So for those of you that are just tuning in late or see this thread on Facebook later, video will be available. So uh, we recorded it. It did happen. It's now a historic event. So again, thank okay. you all, uh, be safe and be well. And we look forward to seeing more of your writing and uh, community building soon. Bye bye, thank you. All right, thank bye. you. Sean, thanks so much.